This lecture is about national identity. Uh, if you watched my lecture that I gave uh, in Roger Williams at Roger Williams a few weeks ago when we were doing that class, did anyone watch that? Okay. Um, if you did, uh, here's going to be a quick little repeat of the first part. Uh, Nelson Goodman, a philosopher, wrote a very useful piece about how buildings mean. And you can take years of uh, highfalutin architectural theory and not get to something so effective and so useful as Nelson Goodman's How Buildings Mean. He says, basically, there are four ways that buildings mean what they mean. The first way is denotation. Uh, buildings sometimes write in verbal language right on the walls. And uh, above the bird on Lincoln's head, you can see inscribed in the wall of the building exactly what is meant by the building. And so the first thing is, is just pure verbal language. The second thing is exemplification. You don't have to know much about architecture. You don't have to know much about history to arrive at this location and say, wow, something important is happening here. Right? You feel it. It's experiential. This is the big one. This is what we mainly care about in architecture school. When you're in studio, you care primarily about this source of meaning. It's the actual physical, spatial experience of people uh, in this context. Oh, Ashley, you still have some shadows casting on that screen. Mm -hmm. And that straw. I was wondering what that was. <laughs> and it happens at multiple scales. It happens at a close-up architectural scale, and it happens at the urban scale. The arrangement of Washington, D.C., which is something we've looked at in this class, has the uh, experience, has the effect, has the impact of saying, wow, whoever this guy was, he was important. He was a god. This temple to Lincoln, uh, you don't have to know his name. You don't have to know the connection with Greek temples. Uh, you can sense from the scale uh, and the visual corridor and all the other indications of experience. You could be a Martian that just arrived on this planet and you would say, wow, this guy was a, big, was a big deal. The third way is through metaphor. Uh, and so this way of building meaning does depend on education, does depend on having some cultural background. We know about Greek architecture being the exemplification of democracy and governance and civil society. And so this vocabulary of form conveys meanings uh, metaphorically through allusion to those other things. And the fourth way buildings mean what they mean is unrelated to the original intentions of any designer or client. Things happen. And history provides uh, meaning to places. Uh, and if you saw the, um, the video from Roger Williams. I then moved on to the World Trade Center since one of the designers of the uh, museum, uh, the National September 11th Museum, uh, was one of the presenters. And so I made the point that the World Trade Center mean, meant one thing, and the events of history has transformed forever what that building will mean, just as uh, Martin Luther King's speech uh, on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial will forever change what the Lincoln Memorial means. Uh, and these things uh, are then redeployed, the architecture is redeployed uh, to serve the function of presenting meanings for large audiences. And so, once again, the four sources, the four different ways that buildings mean uh, denotation, exemplification, metaphorical expression, and the actual events of history. And this is a very useful framework for understanding things. Now, one of the things that we uh, pay attention to 
and the topic of this next week is that diff uh, a, a sing and what we've referred to in previous weeks is that a single form can have multiple meanings. So we presume that a skyscraper in Houston means the same thing as a skyscraper in Singapore, but it doesn't. The same form can mean something very different in different places. There is a slippage between form and meaning. A single form can mean multiple different things. And so let's get to our first example of that. Uh, Japan was a very closed off society uh, for hundreds of years. A very traditional society uh, uh, up to a moment when Admiral Perry entered Tokyo Harbor and said, hello Japan, let me introduce myself. I am the rest of the world and we are here to engage with you in the business of global trade. And it was a hostile um, act to a large extent and uh, it, it, it contributed to a regime change and the new emperor decided it is time for Japan to join the world with a vengeance. And so what had been a closed off traditional society, isolated from the rest of the world, suddenly engaged with the rest of the world uh, and said, uh, we are going to industrialize. We are going to become major uh, advanced civilization uh, embracing technologies. And so you get this type of symbolism uh, emerging uh, using architectural symbolism, and they basically went shopping for what is the architectural language of imperial Japan. Japan said, we are not just going to become an industrial power, we are going to become an imperial power like the nations of Europe. We are going to become strong militarily, and we are going to conquer our neighbors, and we are going to colonize Asia. And they said, we need a language of imperial power. And so they went shopping. They went to London. And they said, we'll take this one. In the 19th century, you may have heard from your history of architecture that there was a debate between classicism and Gothic. Uh, Ruskin, and you, know, you may have, you prob did you hear about this? this? Is it, what's the right form for architecture? Is it Gothic or classical? And the response of one group of architects in London was, listen, get over yourselves. Let's forget about this debate. Let's make beautiful architecture for the sake of beautiful architecture. This resulted in what has become known as the aesthetic movement. So aesthetic movement architecture is characterized by letting the material richness of red brick in contrast with limestone lintels, uh, cornices, uh, and the decorative uh, elements of a facade. And it, this is considered at that moment in the 1880s, uh, during a period of economic boom, uh, to be the proper way to increase the aesthetic delight of cities. And so every city in the world, have you seen this building? I could just as easily show you a, a building on Hemingway uh, because it's almost the same building. It was built at almost the same time for almost the same reasons. It was, there are buildings of this nature everywhere in the world. In every city in the world, you can find a building like this. And it was built in the late 19th century, and it is emulating a style that was uh, in, created in London and broadcast throughout the world, including Japan. But in Japan, it means something different. It has nothing to do with the debate between Gothic and classical, it, this is the architecture vocabulary of power. This, when it was built, this is Tokyo train station. This tells the people of Tokyo, listen people of Tokyo, we are an imperial nation. We have the right to dominate uh, Asia. And so they did. They conquered uh, Seoul, Korea and Taiwan, and they built these buildings everywhere. This is the commander's, uh, uh, commander's headquarters in Taipei, Taiwan, where the Japanese colonized uh, 
the island <clears throat> built this building. And basically this building was an instrument of power. It broadcast its, uh, Japan's intentions to rule over the people of Taiwan uh, forever uh, with its uh, industrial, might, industrial and military might. And, uh, and so there are buildings all over East Asia that were built by the Japanese uh, during their colonial period of the 1930s. Um, and so these are just some examples of them. Now when, when Taiwan, uh, after World War II, when uh, the Japanese, and these are some of the urban forms uh, in Taipei, uh, where Japan built a new city on the location of its uh, the former fishing village. They brought industrial uh, elements. They brought the Japanese religion. So there are Japanese shrines all over Korea and Taiwan. Um, and uh, other styles of building uh, followed as well, including the, the more classical and Baroque. Um, this one is in Seoul, Korea. Uh, it's interesting to compare what happened to the Japanese colonial architecture in Seoul versus what happened in Taiwan. In both places, after uh, the Japanese were defeated in World War II and control reverted to local hands, in both places, the local leadership adopted the Japanese architecture and said, now it is ours, uh, and it means something different. So the same form that in London meant aesthetic movement. In Japan, it meant imperial power. Now, the leadership of Seoul, Korea, and of uh, Taipei, Taiwan, said now it means uh, local rule. It is local government that rules it. And, um, but what soon happened in, um, in Taiwan, the commander's headquarters still remains to the present moment. But in, um, in Seoul, it was only a few decades ago that the people of Seoul decided that it was time to uh, eliminate it. Um, this is in Seoul. Uh, they built this uh, indigenous architecture in front of it to tame it and claim it. Uh, but then they eventually uh, demolished it and eliminated it. And so it's a vivid example of how the language of architecture uh, can be reappropriated. This is back in Taipei, uh, and the language of this building. Uh, and in more of a contemporary, present day view, where it continues to be a symbol of power for Taiwan. Uh, and part of it is the axial arrangement um, that the layout of the city streets are such that it creates a view to the building. Uh, down the broad <coughs> So we're back to that kind of French houseman strategy for um, <laughs> arranging symbols of power in powerful ways. And so you see this down the axis. Uh, and similarly in these buildings. So I'm going to whiz through this in the interest of time um, and get to this example. Uh, in British controlled India. Uh, Edward Lutyens was given the assignment to build a new capital for the Raj, which was the uh, British colonial governance of uh, South Asia. And so they went uh, to the, this uh, city of Delhi, and they uh, built a new city, they laid out a new city according to familiar guidelines of Haussmann's Paris, only this time even more dramatically uh, favoring the diagonals with these hexagonal intersections, which are horrifically um, inconvenient for geometries to build with, um, and for traffic. But they basically relocated the train line that went right through here, and relocated it over here, set up a new station, and establish this new east-west axis that is the basis of colonial Delhi. Lutyens had a handicap in that he hated, hated, hated all 
Indian style and symbols of architecture. Uh, but he eventually gave in and, and embraced them and put them in the framework of a Beaux-Arts arrangement. You see all the symmetry, these grand buildings. And so it reads as a very westernized classical setting, but then within it, he puts the symbols of the elephant and the Ganesh uh, and some of the Indo-Saracenic style of uh, a hybrid between indigenous forms and uh, European settings and deployments of those forms. Um, and so what we're seeing here, the bigger message here is uh, based on Nelson Goodman's principles of how buildings mean, uh, there is a very deliberate deployment of the symbols of architecture uh, to mean a new set of things. Uh, and in this case, and in the cases we're looking at today, they are messages designed to create a single national identity where previously there had been a more multiple uh, set of, of sub-national identities. Every nation, and this is difficult for um, Americans, Usonians, it's very difficult to grasp the sense that every nation is actually uh, a hodgepodge of sub-national identities. Um, so India is chocker block full of ethnic minorities, each speaking a different language as their primary language at home. And then uh, they might learn Hindi or English in school. Uh, they're separated by uh, race and by class. The caste system is one of the most devastatingly divisive uh, social structures ever in human history. Um, and the religious differences between the Muslims and the, the Hindus and the Christians in India and South Asia is to, this, to the present day one of the most devastatingly uh, separate, of, it's a very difficult set of, of forces to overcome. And so one of the big jobs of the British and any national government that, after independence is to find something in common between these people that are fundamentally divided. And so the creation of the symbolism of the nation state performed a very important role in unifying a population that would otherwise want to kill each other. And even when there is an attempt to create a unified nation state in the face of so much diversity, you still have, to, you still have outbreaks of violence between people who want to kill each other because of their differences. Um, this example is we're moving to Sri Lanka off the south east coast of India. Um, uh, the architect, who's heard of the architect Jeffrey Bawa? Um, I'm showing just his house because I think it's one of the great examples of what you can do with domestic space. He basically has this urban site and he divides it into indoor and outdoor rooms. And you can see it most clearly in the, the site plan, where basically there's a gate building that across the front, and you enter here into the first courtyard and then into the house. And every room on the house has access to these gardens that are partially enclosed by, by rooms. And so every room, even though this is a one-story, uh, mostly one-story building, I guess there's an upper story here and here, um, that there's always access to an outdoor garden space uh, on every room, at least one, and often two, and sometimes three. And so it's a very rich experience of this tropical environment, and it's really a, a, a wonderful, when you first look at it, it looks so humble, but it really is a profound uh, idea for uh, architectural experience of a house. And you get things like this. Every room, uh, it's really divided in the outdoor and indoor portions of the space. 
Uh, he was commissioned to build the new capital of Sri Lanka, uh, adjacent to a historic site, an archaeolo archaeological site of an ancient uh, dominant kingdom in, um, in Sri Lanka. And so the job was to connect the modern post-independence uh, uh, government with the original kingdom uh, that was dominant on the island of Sri Lanka. And so the architecture needed to deploy the symbolism of an ancient civilization while at the same time being unabashedly modern about the whole thing. And so the palace complex uh, also had to be grand, and so it incorporates a lot of the same strategies of symmetry, uh, long view corridors, uh, a lot of Beaux-Arts tricks of uh, exemplifying power, uh, at the same time uh, deploying the symbolisms, uh, the, the metaphors and the vocabulary of the ancient civilization that was uh, the result of the archaeological dig. Uh, and there's a sense of a, a palace fortress surrounded by a moat um, and, the, and the nature of an ancient palace, uh, but at the same time a stripped down contemporary deployment of a tectonic language that is simultaneously uh, refers to indigenous traditions of the wooden screen, uh, of the simple wooden columns, but at the same time uh, being unabashedly contemporary about it. Uh, the gold leaf of the ceiling uh, of the parliament hall uh, and the decorative motifs are all referring to uh, some of these indigenous uh, pre-colonial cultures. And so, by reaching back in history to the moment before the British colonized uh, all of South Asia, uh, Jeffrey Bawa bridges uh, over the colonial past and creates a dignity to the modern nation state of Sri Lanka. Uh, you've seen this building, I suspect. Um, do you know who this is? Lu Khan? In, in Dhaka, yeah. Dhaka is the city. It's currently in Bangladesh, but when it was built, it was uh, part of India. Uh, India split between uh, Hindu India and uh, Muslim Pakistan. And uh, East and West Pakistan split, and uh, East Pakistan became Bangladesh one of the most populated countries in the world, uh, very high population density, very prone to flooding. And so we have the capital complex of Dhaka by Liu Khan, uh, trying to do something quite remarkable uh, without overtly referring to the symbols of an in, a pre-colonial indi indigenous culture, to use the tectonic language of uh, these massive concrete uh, monumental constructions uh, to give the experience that harkens back to a pre-colonial era. Um, and so using very simple uh, materials, uh, kind of sloppy concrete, but you know, it's brutal. It's a brutalist vocabulary of board cast <coughs> concrete that leaves the register of its texture uh, all the boards were all uh, put in place by local labor. Uh, and so it's not the highly refined industrial concrete finishes of Salk Institute or Kimball Art Museum. It is very much the rough concrete of uh, the local woodworkers who made the, the formwork. But also this monumental form, uh, and here you have the prayer hall, um, it is ostensibly um, a, a multiple religious place, but uh, is associated uh, with Islam more today than, than uh, it was originally. Uh, and here you see some of the um, scaffolding, the use of bamboo in the construction, and the monumental presence of uh, the assembly hall uh, on the landscape. And so uh, the different architectural strategies uh, that are deployed you can compare uh, what Lucan does uh, with what 
it might be a good exam question, for example, to compare what Lou Kahn does with what Jeffrey Bawa does uh, in his and the two capital complexes between uh, Dhaka, Lou Kahn in Dhaka, and Jeffrey Bawa in Kandy, Kandy, Sri Lanka. Uh, and when we get to Chandigarh, which we will with a guest lecture in a few weeks, also an interesting uh, possible comparison uh, for how does architecture deploy its vocabularies in order to exude a national identity for the purpose of creating a unified nation state in the face of so much diversity and uh, the tensions of subnational cultures uh, in competition with each other. Uh, in this plan, you might note the, uh, the slight jog of the uh, religious hall uh, so that it faces Mecca. And, uh, I guess that's it. So, uh, any questions, comments? That was covering a lot of ground. Uh, but hopefully, uh, in the work you do for next Tuesday, you will be able to search the world for uh, capital complexes uh, that are trying to do the job through architecture and through urban form of exemplifying and metaphorically, symbolically representing uh, national identities for the purpose of creating a unified wow. image and identity for a national culture. Even in the face uh, where there is no national culture, it's an artificial construct, but you still have to create uh, one of these constructs. I would suggest looking uh, at these examples. You could also look at Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, uh, Singapore. Um, there are new capitals in uh, Burma, Myanmar. That's the same country, the two different names. Uh, there's a new capital in North Korea. The uh, images are hard to find, um, <laughs> but they're available, and it's bizarre. Uh, place, so it might be interesting. So what capital complexes uh, could you look at where architecture is deployed for these purposes?